To our next keynote speaker, uh, Janet Salem is based at the UNEP Regional Office for uh, Asia and the Pacific in Bangkok, where she coordinates policy support on resource efficiency and sustainable production and consumption in the Asia Pacific. Prior to this role, she worked with UNEP's International Resource Panel, a global science policy interface on resource issues and uh, for UNIDO on renewable energy and energy efficiency. She has a fantastic presentation in store. Please welcome Janet Salem. Oh, good morning, everyone, and thanks, Damien, for that um, welcome. Um, thank you, Damien, Vina, and Bass for allowing me to participate and share what we've been doing um, in UNEP's Asia Pacific office on resources. Um, this is actually great timing for us because just two, less than two weeks ago, we launched a massive new database on resource use uh, in the region, um, which is quite unprecedented for the region. And uh, I'm really glad that Bass and, and other speakers have emphasised the importance of knowing. Um, you know, if we're going to work on moving towards more with less. We need to know how much is more and how much is less. So putting some numbers behind this is what the database is all about. And, and sort of evening out that asymmetry between Asia Pacific and the rest of the world in having the data to support decisions in policy and in business and to really make the case for resource efficiency. Um, so I'm going to play a short video that we developed um, because you can't list 120,000 numbers and expect a message to come out of it. So we did our best to process it in different formats, including this report that Alex kindly mentioned. And, and, and huge credit to CSIRO for providing all of the knowledge that came out of this report and the data. Um, so uh, if we could play the, the video and then I'll go through a little bit more detail how we got to that point and why we think the information is so important. Natural resources are the price of modern life and the Asia Pacific spends more than the rest of the world combined. <laughs> Resource efficiency in Asia has the potential to double or even triple. We can get more from less, but how can we recognize the opportunities? The United Nations Environment Programme, the CSIRO and Sydney University, have collected 118 resource use indicators for 26 countries in the region for the last 40 years. That's how we know that the region as a whole is extracting over 2,000 trillion litres of water per year. This is the rate we extract water in the Asia-Pacific region all day, every day. That's equivalent to 27 Olympic swimming pools every second. And this is the amount of metal used in the region every single day. That's over 100 tonnes every second. We have over 100 metrics, which means that we know precisely what it takes to build our economies across the region, including the greenhouse gases we add to the atmosphere, which is currently equivalent to 600 tonnes of carbon dioxide every second all day, every day. That's about half the global total. Measuring resources can tell us more than just how much we consume as a region. Indicators reveal opportunities, economic and environmental opportunities. For example, how much water do we need to extract to keep the economy going? This is measured by how much water we use to generate each dollar of GDP. Here in Thailand, for example, it is this much. Looking at economies this way raises questions. Why should the water needed for each dollar in Pakistan be so much greater than in Papua New Guinea? How does the economy of Japan manage with so little water use? 
These questions wouldn't even arise without resource indicators, but the answers can provide the basis for sound environmental and development policies. What about other resources? What does it take to generate one dollar in the Asia Pacific? The resource indicators show a big difference between industrial and developing countries. On average, in developing countries in the region, every dollar of GDP needs this much resource use. This much biomass, represented here by rice, fossil fuels, represented by this coal, metal and construction materials. This is what it takes to earn one dollar in developing economies. It may not seem like very much, but multiply that by the GDP of developing countries, which is 6.5 trillion dollars. Now that's a lot of rice. Add it all up and this is the quantity of resources that powers the economies of developing countries in the region every day. The use of materials in the industrialized countries in the region is very different. Earning a dollar in industrialized countries takes less than one-tenth of the materials. For historical and structural reasons, industrialized countries squeeze a lot more value from the resources they use. Resource indicators give us new insights into economic development and the environment. As economies develop, the demand for resources will increase. There are huge variations across the region, which means there are opportunities for significant improvement. This is how much industrialized and developing countries consumed every day in 1990. Over 20 years, it has changed a lot. We can see the growth in consumption, much of it in China, and consumption continues to grow, which means it is increasingly important to understand how resources are used. Resource indicators raise questions and provide answers. By engaging with data in this way, we can identify economic and environmental benefits across the whole region. For, for taking the time to, to watch that video. Um, and again, I'd like to say a big thank you to, to Alex's team at CSIRO, which has come up with this astounding level of data and brought in other partners in Australia like Sydney University and UNSW um, to get the knowledge out there. And it just goes to show that globally, Australia has a lot to offer in terms of the knowledge base and the understanding side of resource efficiency and has been pretty much front and center of a lot of the information that we have. All right, so I'll get started now with, with my presentation. Bear with me, so, oh, I can look here. Okay. Um, so yeah, I work with the United Nations Environment Program. i step right in. Um, now, the United Nations Environment Program, why are we interested in, in resources? Um, well, we're assigned to be the leading global environment authority that sets the global environment agenda. And our mission is to provide leadership and encourage these partnerships um, in caring for the environment by inspiring and informing and enabling nations and peoples to improve the quality of life without compromising the future generations. We have seven priority areas in UNEP and resource efficiency is, is one of those. So I'll just sort of start with a few basics. Um, what are natural resources? Uh, well, they are the physical basis of our social and economic activities, and everything we do comes down to a bit of resource use. Um, the different categories, if I point, yep. Okay, the different categories we have are materials that we saw in, in the video quite well, I, I hope, um, visualized, energy, water. And using these materials causes emissions. And a lot of these, um, you know, we don't really interact personally with a lot of oil or construction materials. And even getting the fossil fuels, the coal for that video was really difficult. It's a sensitive material that we can't just buy. So these are really hidden and um, uh, very far away from people who are consuming them, and especially the elite people who are making decisions about how they should be used. We worry about resources for two problems. 
problem for two reasons. One is that we have this planet which is supposed to be providing us with these resources. And you think about it, I mean, the, these resources came out of the ground in this quantity every day, just for this region. And it makes you wonder where they came from, who was displaced, what was displaced um, to get them, what was the human cost there and the environmental cost. And the other thing is, of, of course, we have this one planet to work with. And this image of, the, of planet Earth, which was taken um, several dec de decades ago and symbolizes the environmental uh, movement is actually really misleading. We don't even like it that much anymore because, frankly, the environment is so much smaller than that. If you take the entire hydrosphere of the planet, which is such a tiny, thin layer around the world, you get this tiny bubble of water. And same happens if you take the atmosphere. Um, and suddenly, it's not something we need to fly across. You're not flying over the environment anymore. You can sort of imagine that on a human scale. So knowing the amount of emissions that we generate and that we put into these small bubbles is really important. And that's why uh, resource use has come up a lot in the global environmental agenda, and that's where UNEP is playing a role. Um, I want to highlight three things here that are happening. The first is the 10-year framework of programs on sustainable consumption and production, which has been under development since 2002 or earlier, and Bastille played a major role in getting countries together, getting everyone on the same page, and agreeing that this needs some global cooperation. Um, and that was finally adopted in 2012 at the Rio Plus 20 conference. So now we have a framework for action that all member states of the UN are a part of. And it's a sort of an umbrella under which we can have cooperation between countries. Donors can provide funds knowing that it will be used in developing countries um, to support sustainable consumption and production. We also have the, um, currently in process, is the Sustainable Development Goals, similar to the Millennium Development Goals. But these are really tackling a lot of issues that, um, that, that hit um, developed countries as well. Um, two goals and targets under them, a bit, bit of a tricky um, framework, but two of them specifically mention resource efficiency, um, including Goal 8, which is about sustainable economic growth. So that says that all countries should improve progressively and through 2030 global resource efficiency and decouple economic growth from environmental degradation. And goal 12, it's more about sustainable consumption and production. That one also says that we need to achieve sustainable management and efficient use of natural resources by 2030. Now, without having that kind of data, or without having consistent data between countries, it's really difficult to, to monitor this, and uh, we've taken a lot of that, that work out, for, for especially for developing countries, so they don't have to develop their own data sets. Most recently, um, and Heinz Chandel was there to see it, um, we had our first meeting of all the senior officials on environment across the Asia-Pacific region a couple of weeks ago. Now, the Asia-Pacific region is more than half the planet. It goes from Afghanistan, Iran on one side, um, we have Kiribati on the other side, we have Mongolia at the top, and Australia, New Zealand um, on the south. So um, this large collection of diverse countries agreed on these priority areas and um, decoupling economic growth from resource use and pollution is one of them. So our office will be focusing on this topic and the database that's been developed plays a big role. So just a little bit about indicators and why we use them. Um, firstly, they're there to inform us about the issues. So we might not have even realised that they were an issue, but if we have a number on it, if we can visualise it, I'd never seen a ton of CO2 before, and it's quite, a, it's quite big, just one. Um, then we, we can understand issues on a little bit more of a human level. The second thing is it helps set the agendas, see which uh, issues are more important than others. Um, it facilitates having an informed public debate, not just a, de a debate based on anecdotes or inconsistent and coherent data. Um, next, it underpins policy goals, like improving resource efficiency and policy statements, usually in the form of um, quantified targets. And lastly, we can, we can use them to measure progress in achieving those policies. 
So uh, about two and a half years ago, um, with the help of CSIRO and, and other partners, we consulted governments in the region to develop a framework of indicators. How do we understand resource use in the region and how do we want to monitor it and why? And we came up with these, um, uh, we came up with other policy domains as well, but we came up with these six main categories that we wanted to explore. The first one is um, natural resource use, and, and a lot of the data has been um, shown indicatively there. Um, it says it, it, it's basically the total amount of natural resource use um, per country, and then just to be help countries compare with each other, we also have the per capita amounts, so you can normalise that data a little bit. Um, and the policy use is it's basically the evidence based for decoupling policies. It shows the physical scale of the economy. Um, and there are a few indicators here, yep, uh, a few indicators just listed down there, under there. And I should say that uh, the database contains 157 indicators for every country. And for each one of those 157 indicators, we have a time series of at least 20 years, and most of the time up to 40 years. And we have this for 26 countries. So you multiply that out, you get um, over 100,000. Um, so one of the findings um, you can see here is that um, this is all material use, and I'll focus on materials and not energy or water. Um, the Asia-Pacific region is here in pink and purple, which were my boss's favourite colours, so they come up a lot. And the rest of the world is in grey. So you can see in the year 2010 that Asia dominates. It, has f it uses 53% of the materials, but at the moment only makes 25% of GDP. So that's going to change, and the question is, how's that going to change? If we look at per capita amounts, um, you can see up here Bangladesh with 1.7 tonnes per capita per year, and um, Australia here. And then the average is about 9.6 in the region, 9.6 tonnes, so you can see the rate. Um, and the different trends, so in the green we have China, the resource use per capita going up and up and up, Japan coming down in, in the red, and Philippines sort of staying stable. So there's a v big variety across the region. It's good to know where you stand um, as a country. The second one is um, trade dependency. It's how dependent you are in your imports and exports on resource use that's happening around the world. Um, so for importers um, like Japan, um, the professor mentioned there's not many resources in Japan. A lot of it has to be brought in. So resource efficiency, using those resources most efficiently is a big priority. For export countries like, you know, you have Lao, PDR coming up, you have Mongolia, Indonesia. The main issue is to track if the revenues from these resources are really reaching the people that um, own them. Um, so I think I'm running a bit out of time. I might skip through, but you see the, um, the different types of profiles. Australia with a giant extraction in the middle, a little bit of import, a lot of export, and the opposite happening here in Japan. Okay, resource productivity I think is one of the most interesting. It's basically asking how much value are you getting compared to what you're extracting from the ground. So this is going to be increasingly important for developing countries as they use more and more resources. They're actually not really very efficient with them yet. Um, so how do you increase the resource efficiency is a big question. Um, just here you can see some different sort of funnels going into one dollar, um, how much it takes. In Vietnam, which is not the highest, by the way, <laughs> Mongolia is the highest, I think, you, get, you need nine kilograms to make one dollar. And then you have different countries, and then all the way here, Japan is the most efficient. Um, the blue line here shows the trend over time for developing countries, which dominate <coughs> resource use in the region. So the good news is that it is improving at a rate of about 1.5% per annum, but still lagging way behind the rest of the world. Um, which is comparatively much more resource efficient. Still big opportunity there, and that's where I think a lot of countries will be looking. Um, Eco-efficiency of production is probably the most innovative part of the database. We can now look at which sectors are using the resources. Let me skip. So we have these sort of heat maps now, where you have the mining and energy, agriculture, manufacturing, construction, transport and services. And for each country, you can sort of see where the resources are being sunk, and this is a footprint point of view. 
Speaking of the footprint, uh, the whole database is almost split into two, one showing direct material use or resource use, and the other half showing a footprint um, perspective. And that basically means that whatever resource use happened um, wherever it is in the world to produce your imports will now be accounted to the people who are importing. So if you import orange juice, it's not only the mass of the orange juice, but also the orange peel, the fertilizer, no matter where it was in the world, will now be attributed to your resource consumption. Um, so that's a good complement to your direct resource use. Um, so here we see um, if you set the direct resource use to 100%, so just set everyone to 100%, that's the dotted line out here, and um, the, the colored circle is in the footprint you'll see there's one of two patterns. Either you're using less. Um, so in the case of China, for example, 15% of resource use, or the footprint is 15% smaller than the actual resource use. And I should add that actual resource use already corrects for exports. If you're exporting something, if it's left your boundaries, it doesn't even fit in that first category. Um, so you have a lot of countries like that. And then on the other side, you have countries like Singapore where they're actually using double the amount of um, materials that are normally accounted for. Uh, and then uh, adjusted resource productivity, again, you can look at um, the material use per dollar or the footprint per dollar. And so I've sort of lined them up a bit and um, the blue line, which is developing countries uh, between 1970 and 2000, it's come down. But if you look at the footprint, it's actually not coming down as much, it's sort of leveled off lately. So, um, so lastly, I just want to say that communicating is important. We all have a lot of information um, in our institutions and in our, in our minds, but it's really important to be getting it out. So um, we've got it in a different, few different formats, a, a report, we've got infographics, we have a video, and we have some interactive infographics, which I wanted to show, but I think we won't have time. But if you do want to s download the data or if you want to see the video or get the report, you can just go to unep.org forward slash Asia Pacific indicators. And I'd also be really happy to, to talk with you individually to see how you can, we can help you use the information um, and how we can work together on that. So thank you very much, Damien. Sorry I went a little over time. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Janet, I think really that's all about insights with impact and it shows the importance of both data and indicators and clear communication for putting resource productivity on the agenda, not only in the, in the, uh, the region but internationally through the Sustainable Development Goals.